Hey everybody, I'm Sean. I'm with uh, Fisher Scientific, so a part of Thermal Fisher Scientific. I sound like a commercial right now, but um, you'll, we'll, I'll get to the point. Um, I will, first of all, I want to thank Karen for um, inviting me to this panel, giving a bunch of um, high school students like yourself this opportunity to really talk to a lot of industry professionals. I think this is an awesome experience. Um, I know it's 2 p.m. on a Friday. You probably want to go home and play video games. I totally understand, but if I'm talking too fast, feel free to stop me down. Um, tell me, hey, like, can you repeat what you just said? I'm more than happy to do that again. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was actually born and raised in Taiwan. So it's so you, you probably see China and then you see like this little island right next to it. Um, that's where Taiwan is. Um, I grew up my entire life pretty much in Taiwan. I didn't come here until 2012 and it's weird because um, I know for you high school students, um, you got a chance to really visit all the universities before actually attending. So that give, kind of gives you a better outlook for what you're expecting when you attend there, what type of people you kind of get in touch with. But for us, the best thing we have is YouTube. Um, sometimes like Google Maps and you zoom in a little closer and you're like, oh, that's cool. That's what the university looks like. I had no idea what um, UCSD, so University of California, San Diego was the university I went to. I had no idea what that looked like. Um, I have cousins who live near the hospital near San Diego and they're like, oh yeah, UCSC is a party school, so you should definitely go. So I was like, oh cool, whatever, let's do it. And of course, like being, being my parents, that's all they care about, grades, ranking and everything, that was probably the best school I got into. So USA News, UCSD, highest on the rank. So let's just make him go there because we're paying for it anyway, so he doesn't have a say. So that's kind of how I ended here in 2012. Um, I came in as a biochemistry with a cell biology major. I was really gun ho going to medical school. Um, that was kind of the goal of why I started doing biochemistry and cell biology. It was cool. You know, you, I thought I could really get a chance to get some hands-on experience with science um, in a whole completely different country. And unfortunately, halfway through, I thought about really, I, so I took a bunch of jobs, to be honest. Um, Colleges are pretty good in a sense that they will give you portals where you can apply for all the jobs that you want. And because with technology being this good, you literally click one button and they'll submit the, your resume for you, which is awesome. Um, back then I had to really go to professor's doors, door by door, hand in my resume, go to office hours, beg for potential internships, beg for free volunteer experience. Um, I think UCs or like the American colleges as a whole has really done a good job in really streamlining that process. Oh, hi Nancy, my manager's online. So <laughs> just wanna say hi. And um, so yeah, I took on all sorts of jobs. I took on some jobs um, that I was working as a volunteer for where I literally did protein work through a computer. And I had no idea what I was doing. It was 20 hours a week of free labor for the professors. And I literally just clicked around and hopefully I got something out of it to put on my resume. Um, after doing that for a little bit during my college years, um, about half a year or so, I switched over to an actual biotech company. Um, it was called Saragon Pharmaceuticals, where I focused on extracting tumor cells from mice. And that was my actual first paid job, pretty much that's related to science. Um, what I did was I just um, pretty much just located a bunch of mice, probably like 200 mice per session. And it was, it was, a, it was I, I don't want to say it's like, the best job I've ever taken, but it was something to get me started, get me like a foot into understanding what research was like. Uh, I did that for about eight months and I kept on applying. So my, my whole mentality was, you know, I'm, I'm already here. I travel 7,000 miles away, so far away from home. My parents dropped me off at the airport and said, peace out. And I kind of had to do something about it. So, you know, never be afraid. It's something for high school kids um, as you progressively going to college and do all that fun stuff. Never be afraid to apply. My job application site always had more than 500 applications. I probably heard back from three. I'll take my chances, right? That's a 0.6%, I think. Yeah, if you do the math, yeah, it's about 0.6%. And thankfully, um, the end of my sophomore year in college, I landed an internship at Fisher Scientific for um, like pretty much, I was a flyer boy at University of California, San Diego in the, account, in the school that I attended. So it kind of made life a lot easier. I was able to go to school and work as a Fisher Scientific intern. And that was 2013, I think. Yeah, wow, it's been seven years. And I've fell in love with this, the business aspect of science ever since. 
I'd have never known that there was such a big piece to what um, like the science sales had been prior to doing this. I thought there was just research. I thought like beakers, pipettes would just magically appear on lab benches because you never really think about why, where these things come from. You kind of just like, oh yeah, let's go pipette stuff. Let's go like kill some mice, cut out their tumors. But there's actually a whole business of supplying these equipment in an easy orderly manner. And that's where people like myself, um, Nancy, my manager, that's where we come in and really facilitate the process. I don't want to say that this completely takes you away from the science aspect because every day you're talking to researchers, right? Every day you're meeting new customers who's doing great work out there. And um, it's really nice to feel that my degree has really given, given me the ability to make an impact in these people's lives, especially if you're the one to facilitate the process of making things purchasing easier, making tracking back orders easier, tracking, you know, lost things or replacing things that weren't supposed to be at certain places easier. Um, that's something I really value about what Thermo Fisher can offer. Um, so moving on, uh, after I graduated from college, I was lucky enough for Thermo Fisher to hire me, but I didn't go straight to where I was right now. I went to the lab equipment division. So you see your big freezers, your big centrifuges, um, your big incubators, like ULP. Um, once you go there, you'll see those really nice equipment, all that really fancy, expensive things that you really don't want to touch just in case you break it. But I'm just kidding. They're, they're a lot sturdier than that. But um, it's something that I thought was super cool being the first job out of college. And I continue to be at University of California, San Diego, continue to serve my university that I spent four years and paid a lot of money for. But it was cool being able to see the professors who used to like, almost gave me C's, but I'm like, hey, I'm your, I'm your sales rep now. So, you know, you better watch out. No, no, I'm just kidding. I, I never did anything like that. But it's good to honestly keep in contact with all these sciencey people that I really thought that I never would get a chance to if I stepped into the business side. So what, what I really find interesting is that over the years, um, being a Thermo Fisher rep, I felt that I was able to actually work with people who've done science and learn more about science than I did in my past four years going to school. Because going to school, you know, you go to lecture, sometimes you don't go, it's 8 a.m., it's really hard for you to go. I try to go to all my classes. We have eye clickers, they check your attendance, you work the part of your grade. So I highly recommend everybody go. I'm not trying to support anything that you shouldn't be doing, but um, given that, I think this job has really given me a great chance to stay connected and make me feel that hey, like I'm actually using some of my personal both skills, some of my soft skills on top of my science skills to be able to talk with researchers and really facilitate that. But it wasn't until last October where Nancy Withers, she's my manager here, and she's like, Sean, here's a rope, catch. And I was like, wait, what? Come to Fisher? Okay. So I caught on the rope and I switched over to the Fisher scientific side. So this is very different from what I used to do. Back then, like I mentioned, I was dealing with equipment. I was solely on the manufacturer side, but for what I currently do right now, it is solely for distribution. So distribution is nice because I don't just focus on one line of products. I focus on every single thing that you could see in the lab. Anything that you walk into ULP research places, you could see like the beakers, the pipettes, the tips, the boxes, the lab coats, anything that you could think of that goes into a lab they don't just magically appear there's people like myself who actually will come talk to the researchers understand what they're doing really find the best product to cater to their needs and being thermal fisher one of the largest um, medical device supplies companies in the world we can supply over two million products with nine thousand different vendors and the possibilities are insane i mean think about us kind of like amazon but for science equipments um i I don't think we have like Fisher Prime. We have contracts like Biocom that will make delivery faster, um, free shipping and all that good stuff. But think of us like the one stop shop for every single medical de devices, medical supply, medical equipment that you can think of. And our management team is absolutely amazing because in, in, in knowing that coronavirus, when coronavirus started happening, what one big issue that we had nationwide was we didn't have masks. We didn't have a lot of protective gear. We didn't have a lot of things that were essential to making sure that the public was safe, but we were able to acquire, our management team did a really great job in acquiring all of these specific products that would help the researchers continue their research because we are probably, well, like healthcare is probably the most essential business during these such weird times. 
And we want to make sure that everyone has necessary supplies they need and the necessary equipment they need to continue doing all the great stuff like like Hugh Bender himself, um, Rachel Mudd, um, everyone who's doing science, I am really, really proud to be able to continue servicing people, individuals like that. So I think for what, for, for, for high school, I mean, I know this is probably just off the head, like, well, what is he talking about? Don't feel that you are limited to just doing science, just doing science. There is a career for you if you like talking to people, if you like hanging out with people, if you like bothering people, but still be able to use your science degree and, uh, and not have to feel that you're limited to just one alley. I know um, it can be kind of discouraging if you have parents who are really pressuring you like, oh, you have to be a doctor or whatever, or you have to like go a certain route, but just know that there's always gonna be an open opportunity, like Thermo Fisher, for instance, doing research, going to PhD, doing a master's, becoming a doctor. There's always going to be a route for you that will enable you to do something successful and contribute. And, you know, never be fearful for whatever you do because this is the time to do it. I mean, we like, you know, people say YOLO. I don't really agree with that when, when it comes to like doing crazy stuff, but you honestly only live once and you honestly only get this chance to kind of try new things and really know what you really like and know what you really don't like. And only giving it a shot will give you the possibility of understanding that. And, um, and I honestly gave, a lot of shots throughout life. Like my first job, I think at college, I was working at Rubio's. They put me on taco, uh, put me on taco Tuesdays only, and then put eight hour shifts. And I thought I was so cool. Right? I was like, Oh, I just started. I must be good. Or else why would they put me for eight hour shifts? Because nobody wanted to do the eight hour shifts. So, you know, you, you a lot of it's trial and experience. And sometimes you'll feel like there's nothing that's really good for you, but don't forget that is absolutely not true believe in yourself and keep applying and keep trying new things because there is so much opportunity out there regardless of what you like and what you want to do. And after being in America for this is my eighth year, um, that's probably one of my biggest take home lessons that, you know, if you don't, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. If you watch the office, that's from Michael Scott. But I think with everything that's happening, Things get discouraging. There's a lot of disparities. There's a lot of angry people out there, but just know that there is many things that you can do to find the things that you truly like and just keep pursuing it and don't give up. So- I have a question. Yeah. What does your day look like as a sales rep? Like you wake up in the morning, it's Monday. What, so, what does that week look like for you? Like, you know? So it could range from waking up and then you see there's 40 emails and you just want to close your eyes and go back to sleep, but you can't because you <laughs> feel paranoid. There's like a little bit of you deep down there where you just can't really sleep anymore. Um, sometimes it's not as busy, but it will eventually get busy. It would, I would generally, before COVID, I would um, wake up. I would try to do at least like the first, like I would set a timeline. Like I wake up at like 6.30 or 6.45. I would do emails until like 8 or 8.30. I would start checking, um, see if any customers replied to me from last week. Cause I like to set up my appointments a week before. So if they get back to me that, Hey, I am available to meet this afternoon or the afternoon then I would go out. And then they, if I go out and meet like two or three customers that would take like four hours of my time, depending on how long they take sometimes even longer. And when I get home, I probably have another 30 emails I need to take care of. These emails are not just like, hey, I'll take care of this. I'll send you a quote. It could range from I need to call five different people to make sure this is in stock to do something as easy like, oh, yeah, sure. No problem. Let's let's make this or whatever or something very, very common. And every day is something different. There's not really a time where I can be like, hey, I'm expecting this customer to ask for this. I mean, that would be nice. I would really make my life a lot easier, but it's never really like that. And it, the nice thing about this job is you can't expect single day to be similar to the day before and you're always being new researchers if you like talking to people if you're a very sociable person if you just can't shut up during school uh, like myself um i feel like this is definitely a route to explore 
um, there's no, there's not really like a really strict requirement. It would really help if you were, you did something science related, but overall, um, if you have the motivation and you want to succeed and you want to help people, this is the perfect job for you. Great. Now, um, you know, obviously you have a science degree, but there's lots of sales representatives that don't even have a science degree, right? So what type of support do you get, like, when you get, like, a science-y question, right? Somebody wants to run an experiment or a protocol and they need help. What kind of support do you draw upon to help you with that? So we have a bunch of specialists. We have vendors um, who are specialists. We have uh, vendors own specialists so it comes down to the people that you know I, I try to like put together like a huge excel sheet for all the specialists all the vendors and what they cover specifically so that if i do come across a question like that which which i personally can't answer i would definitely rally that information over to the specific vendor because last thing you want is telling something someone something incorrect and that's really not what we're trying to do here <laughs> Right. So um, it sounds like you came from an intern and you were in a different position and now you're, you know, um, as a sales representative. Now, what is what is the next, you know, five steps, four or five steps, you know, as you promote, right? Nancy's your boss, obviously. Like, what does that career journey look like as a sales representative, like as you go on in your career? Or do um, you, are you just a sales rep for the rest of your life? Or, you know, what, so what does that I, career tra trajectory look like? So, I, like I said, I could be I could be complacent I could do this for the rest of my life um, there's industry directors who are in charge of specific industries so for large pharmas like Pfizer um, Takeda Johnson Johnson they would have their own individual industry directors who will work specifically for pricing contracts that would be like upper management a lot more paperwork a lot less I would say customer facing as opposed to normal sales reps or I could potentially be a manager at some point right Nancy like, okay, she's not responding, so she's no. She's like no, but um, but yes, um, yes, those two. Yes, routes. Sean will definitely move into a leadership role at some point, and I told him, uh, like I've actually asked him to take over for a few things for me. And he's like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready yet. I'm like, yes, you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely, and um, there's also um, I could definitely consider a manufacturer route. Like like I said, we're kind of like the distribution one stop shop, but there's many manufacturers who do similar. Um, jobs, but they would be very focused products, like kind of similar to what I originally started with, but different companies. So like Corning, for instance. Um, so like you can look at Eppendorf. Um, once you guys get a chance to go inside the ULP labs, you'll see those specific company names on the products that you're using. All of those pretty much have a sales rep and all of those are potential jobs that you can apply to if that's something that interests you. Now, can you share with us, you know, um, you know, being a sales rep is not a, a typical job. You're not coming to the office every day, sitting at one desk every day. What kind of perks are there besides, it sounds like you have a lot of flexibility, right? So I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the perks? Like, what do you love most about um, being a sales rep? You're obviously, obviously at home right now, which is really nice. <laughs> but so, what, what other perks are there? Do you like get a car allowance? Do you get a, you um, know, do you get a cell phone? I mean, yeah. what types of additional pluses do you get? So, kind, so yes. So um, for us specifically, we have our own company car. So that's really nice. Um, we have an extra phone. So a lot of people think I'm like a spy or something because I bought two phones, but I'm like, just, just not that important. Like, like, you know, it, you know, we all know it. Um, we have, um, I have a company iPad as well. Um, I don't use it as much because I'm on my phone more, right? It's like a millennial issue. Like, you know, you all can relate. Um, it, it's it's kind of nice in the sense that you can technically work for when you want to. Like, I guess you could sleep in if you want to, but you really don't want to do that because when you sleep in, you wake up, there's like a hundred emails and like a little bit of me gets like a heart attack. So I try, I try to be on top of it as much as I can um you sometimes uh depending on your accounts sometimes your customer could message you after hours i've gotten emails at 9 or 10 p.m and i mean I, I i try to reply around that time as long as i'm awake and um like somewhat my brain somewhat functioning and i will do my best to reply and so it, it kind of it, it really depends on your personality if you're willing to like stomach consistently like over the, you sometimes have to do work over the weekend i've done work on saturday sundays um I've done 
work like around like 12 a.m. Sometimes if I'm still awake, um, sometimes more flexibility can equal to also more work or consistent work. Great. And if anybody's had any questions, please put it in the chat box. I see Eunice on camera. Eunice, do you have any questions? Do you want to talk to Sean a little bit? Um, Eunice, is, Eunice has been with us all day. She's one of our MIE students. And um, and say hi. You know, This is your chance to connect with um, our industry professionals. So please feel free. Um, so our MIE students, Sean, just so you know, they're at the stage right now. There's about 53 of them right now. Okay. Um, they're working in groups of four to five, and they're working on an unmet clinical need um, presented by um, some of the CHOC clinicians. Eunice, what project are you working on? Maybe you could share a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm working on solving the issue of lost surgical instruments. So oh, I have awesome. a question about it that's like kind of specific to what you do, but like just like to preface, does uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific sell surgical instruments? Yeah. Sells what? Like surgical instruments? Yeah, yeah, we do. Oh. Depending, yeah, we have from the most basic, well, it depends on what you're looking for, like basic scalpels, like knives. Uh, I'm guessing like. Or any. like huge, the larger ones, like um, I know Striker, Striker is like a really popular one, but that's like a whole different surgical aspect that we don't necessarily get into. Well, I'm guessing it's just like overall, like any- Yeah, we, we do, we do, we, we, we definitely do. There's, there's just so, I, I can't list like, I can't list off like a specific type off the top of my head, but we, we definitely do. Yeah, so I guess my question's like a little like directed specifically, cause you said like you worked in like distribution and like previously in manufacturing, did you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so do your clients like often lose instruments and do you know like, the causes of that? Lose instruments as in like a centrifuge disappears halfway through shipping, like something like that, like a freezer or something disappears through shipping or... Well, I don't, I'm not necessarily like talking about like the whole like delivery process where it gets uh -huh. lost in delivery, but more like in like an OR after surgery, like somehow the team loses like an instrument. So do they often like, do clients often call you to replace those? Uh, well, it, it's really case by case sometimes um, if it's our fault there's a certain limit to where we would determine if something is our fault and whether it's something that's a customer error it, it really it's a case by case scenario I've, I've had to replace many things before um, and I've also had to push back let them know hey this is this is the situation it seems like this is something that went wrong and it we can't justify making the replacement and it's definitely something it's those are like people skills that you will eventually learn on the job and you will have to, a lot of trial and error, of course, a lot of, you know, getting stuff thrown at me. No, well, not like physically, but like metaphorically. And um, it's, yeah, I, I definitely. Think what, I, think what, um, I think what Eunice was talking about was um, because her unmet clinical need is uh, lost surgical tools and from the OR, right? So mm -hmm. I think she was trying to, I don't know if you service any hospitals. Um, not as much. Um, not so much. Yeah. So I think her question is, do you have any experience of missing surgical tools from the OR and what, um, as you know, as it relates to her project as that's the unmet clinical needs she's trying to address. And do you have any insight that you can share about that need or if you have any insight in regards to any process processes in the OR that can be improved? Uh, to prevent lost instruments. <laughs> oh, prevent lost instruments. Um, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not too familiar. I've never actually had any hospital accounts. I haven't worked with that many surgical tools, but um, usually, uh, depending on the company you're working with and what specific instrument you're using, every company kind of has their own policies for what they can do in assisting customers re with replacements. Some are pretty lenient, some are like, as soon as it leaves our loading dock, um, it's out of our hands. So there's nothing we could do to help you. Um, and it also depends Sean, on- the um, Sean does have a medical device company, C-Spine, that has hardware used in surgeries, but our, we're not really part of that business. So those sets are replenished in a third party, like by a third party group um, offsite. 
Uh, and but the part of the business that we support, that Sean supports, is more the consumable side of the business. So they have a orthobiologic side of their business. It's injectable bone. That's more the side of the business that we support. The reusable hardware that comes back, you know, gets washed and comes back. We don't really help out with that side of the business. Yeah. I guess my question was a long shot, but I thought I'd ask, um, given that you guys work in like distribution and like manufacturing. Uh, thank you, though. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Now, um, Sean, besides, well, you've mentioned some of the necessary skills that you, know, you have to like to talk to people. Um, it sounds like you're multitasking and juggling a lot. I mean, what other um, traits or competencies, um, you know, would make you a good, you know, sales rep and, you know, go up that career pathway? Um, I, for, for me personally, you just got to be down with it. I think for me personally, like, I don't care what the issue is. I don't care. Like, whenever, if someone needs help, I'm down to jump in and, like, get dirty with them. Like, I've fixed, I've tried to fix freezers before. I've tried to fix equipment before. Um, I've tried to, I've brought, I've manually brought shipments from one site to the other for, for Fisher actually, just so they could get their vials sooner because they need it for production. Um, I think that go-getter, that go-getter personality would really make the job easier. Rather than think of it as a task, think, think about like, hey, I'm like just helping a homie out. Um, that's kind of how I see it for all my customers and if like if anyone needs any help at any certain part of time, if I can do it without having to lose a leg or arm, um, I'm down with it. Awesome. Um, now, you know, we all, you know, you're obviously, you know, making a living, right? So as a sales representative for, you know, um, like when an entry level position, let's say you, you have a four year degree, right? Obviously. Like what is the anticipated salary range? And I'm sure, you know, in your role, maybe you can talk about, you know, maybe you get bonuses or rewards besides your perks. What kind of compensation, you know, package is pretty is pretty typical as you enter this field? Uh, it depends on seniority. Also, uh, I think mainly it's seniority. Um, we, it's nice we have a we have like a basin um, commission. So, and it, it's really it depends on how much you negotiate, who your manager is, what your previous job experiences are, which company you came from. There's a lot of factors that come into play, but generally, um, it, there's we have like band levels depending on like how how senior, how junior you are. Um, for people starting like straight out of college, um, generally start at band four. I can't speak to the exact dollar amount, but it would it it it's if you go on Glassdoor, it's pretty accurate, <laughs> relatively accurate. Um, I, I it also depends on the region. I, I would s assume that California is a little better than somewhere in the Midwest or somewhere in the South. Um, I would expect New York or those coast cities to pay a little bit better. I, I would assume Northern California to pay a little bit better because of the cost of living. Um, I wanna say Thermal Fisher has been very fair and um, they would really take into consideration a lot of this and treat your employees very well and have a great manager. So it all kind of helps. Perfect. So it sounds like you got great. Um, you're with a large organization, right? Um, we just had Dr. Bender who was in like a startup world. Yeah, you know, um, can you talk about, um, you're obviously with a larger company. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you joined Thermo and the Fisher. Um, can you talk about the importance of company culture to you? Like what, did you, did you weigh that at all? Was that important to you? Or were you just like, I gotta just hit the ground running? What, did you weigh that at all? Was that really important to you? Uh, I didn't think about it too much, to be honest. Um, I uh, for my previous division, the, the manufacturing uh, group, uh, the, like part of the manufacturing part of Thermo that I was in, I definitely want to say I was probably the youngest guy in the entire division. I mean, I did come straight out of college. I was like 21, 22. And um, it was weird going to national sales meeting and everyone's like, oh, you could be my kid or something like that. And um, coming to, I mean, I never thought too much about it, to be honest. I think everyone's super friendly. I, I didn't meet anybody who was like condescending just because of my, just because of how young I was. Everyone was willing to talk to me and share their experiences and very willing to, you know, kind of promote me. But I want to say I definitely enjoy coming over to the distribution. And I feel like, especially like on our team, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people closer to my age, a lot of people my age. And I didn't start thinking about how much that meant to me until I actually switched over. 
So I, I definitely would um, like suggest that that's something that people should always take into consideration. Um, I know it's hard if you first get out of college, your first job, you're just like, oh, I need to get paid. So like my parents won't like cut your head off, cut my head off. So um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of worked out for the better, I think, after switching over. And yeah, I don't necessarily look back. <laughs> Now, um, you know, our, our students here today are faced with a different um, environment than, um, than you were because you got a lot to do a lot of in-person door knocking to get those opportunities with, you know, so many things going virtual, including this program, right, gone virtual. Um, what, I mean, what is your advice as a professional in the biotech industry? Maybe Nancy, you can weigh on this. Um, you know, how... What are your thoughts in regards? What's the best way for students to find more work-based learning activities or, you know, engage with professionals and, you know, for career exploration or career opportunities, right? Uh, so do you want to go or I can start? Yeah, Sean, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I think you would be surprised by how many people are afraid of reaching out and the impact that it gives or the impression that it leaves in a professional's or like anybody's uh, head when you actively reach out, like schedule a Zoom call, you know, like hop on a phone call, you know, we can't grab coffee anyways. But um, I think that's something like I, I emphasized that many times um, earlier when I was talking about my experiences that um, you actually reaching out and making that extra step can take you a very, very long way. Even like just a thank you letter, even just like, message you someone on LinkedIn that you've never met before. I mean, half the time, you might get, re you might get no response half the time, but the other half of the time, if you get lucky a few times there, it could be a game changer for your career. Nancy, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think the networking piece is huge. I mean, you never know what kind of connection that you make early in your career, how that will help you later in your career, or just having a disinterested third party to bounce ideas off of. Um, I've kept in contact with people I've worked with all along the way, and it's, you never know how that can be helpful. Um, and people are way more willing to mentor than you think. And so I, to Sean's point, reaching out to different people, you know, I, I can give Karen my contact info. I'd be happy to help anybody that wants to, you know, ping me for anything. I'd be happy to help out. Um, so yeah, not being afraid to reach out. Um, my, my own kids are in high school and I've had to figure out what to do with them this summer, you know, it's like a big giant blank, you know, you can't volunteer anywhere. You can't internship. You can't really get a job. Um, uh -oh. Oh. Dennis? No, I think that's her. Oh, Nancy got frozen. You fell asleep on camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this, you're like, oh, and yeah. Continue to network along the way is good advice. Great. Yeah, it's really, um, you know, I really give you guys kudos this summer for, you know, participating in this MIE program and um, taking that, you know, step to continue to stay engaged. Um, I don't know if any of the teachers are on right now. Um, maybe Rachel, our biotech teacher. Rachel actually knows Sean. Rachel was in the, um, in the lab with the um, ULP biotech experience with her kids. So she's our teacher again um, for this course, supporting these students. Um, but, oh, there she is. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, any last questions that we can pitch to Sean before we go on our break uh, for our prototyping um, segment at three? Um, my question was, how much of your science background and knowledge of labs do you use on an everyday basis now that you've been in the routine of being a sales rep for a few years? Uh, I, at the beginning, um, I, th I think it's pretty useful at the beginning because what I generally do is, um, it, it's nice when somebody says Tripsin and I'm like, oh, it's Tripsin, T-R-Y-P-S-I-N in my head. <laughs> so like, at, at, like, you know, uh, instead of getting confused and like spelling it wrong and having a hard time looking it up online, than what it is. Um, I would say at the beginning, I won't, I think I'd use like 60, 70% of it. Um, having worked in the lab really helped too, because I could look at a freezer and be like, oh, that's a minus 80 and not think I could put like my lunch in there. So um, a, 
I think definitely working, I mean, my working experience as an undergrad, as well as um, like what the school taught me to recognize where equipment are, how to like use a pipette, like press the wrong, right side instead of pressing the wrong side and all that. Um, at the very beginning, it really did help, but over time, it becomes kind of like your muscle memory. You kind of see a cell culture lab. You're like, oh, they're getting any petri dishes, filtration, filtered tips, and all that. Um, so it becomes more muscle memory. I want to say it's definitely a lot more helpful, but you can definitely learn that as well if you don't have a science background with practice and time.